Good morning. It is a good morning. It's a great morning. It's good to be here to see all of you and to be alive and to be able to worship God on this beautiful day here in our neck of the woods. And uh, it's just my joy and pleasure to welcome you all to worship. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, no matter who you are and no matter where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here at the Neighborhood Church because this is a place where we are all children of God. Each and every one of us is a child of God, and we're equal before God. We, we come into God's presence because God loves all of us. No matter who we are, no matter what our background, we're all welcome here. And I want to give a special welcome to our online worshipers today, too. Thank you for joining us uh, through our live streaming. And uh, we're just glad that everybody can be here today to share in a time of uh, community building and worship. It's a very special day in the life of our church. I'm gonna say more about that later. There's a lot going on today, uh, and I'll fill you in on that uh, later in our community concerns toward the end of the service. But for now, let me just say, um, we're so glad you're here and welcome. Let's uh, quiet ourselves now and perhaps uh, still our minds and our spirits enough to truly center ourselves and come into God's presence. This is a time when we want to be aware of and open to and experiencing the presence of God. We do that when, I, when we turn our hearts and trust toward God. And so we do that today as we come to worship. Let us worship our God in a spirit of openness and truth as we hear now the prelude.
Let us continue our service by praying together the opening prayer that is printed in your order of worship. As changes in the world around us remind us of life's unceasing rhythms, we gather in community this day, O God of our past and prompter of our future. Stir us into this brief hour of reflection and meditation, that we might be lifted in love and equipped for living in your purposes. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. We are all on a journey together. We are all on a journey to come to know and understand God. But sometimes we get off of that journey. We start taking a different path. And quite frankly, sometimes we start following false gods, such as the gathering of money, drugs, alcohol, or seeking privilege because of our status in society. Those are false gods, and when they consume us, they are definitely false gods. So we need to make that 180 degree turn away from those false gods and ask God for forgiveness. So let us all pray the prayer of confession printed in our order of worship. We are involved in the mystery of our origins, O God of our creation. And so we wonder why we are here and what we bring to enhance the common good. We are immersed in the mystery of the journey itself, O God of movement. And so we search for some sign of meaning along the way, which will help us to see and to celebrate. We are puzzled by the mystery of destination, O God of futures. And so we stretch out our very being toward new possibilities, seeking your plan for our lives. Forgive us on this day of reflection and renewal for avoiding our past, delaying our present, fearing our future, for we would claim the companionship of Christ in whom all things hold together and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. No matter how far we have strayed from God, no matter what the reason was that we strayed from God, we all can be very confident here today that through Jesus Christ, we have all been truly forgiven. Our first scriptural reading for today is Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even where your hand, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and night wraps itself around me, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inner inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 
Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, yet when, when none of them yet as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. Oh, that you would kill the wicked, O God, and that the bloodthirsty would depart from me. Those who speak of you maliciously and lift themselves up against you for evil. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Thus ends our first reading. Our second scripture reading is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 7 through 19. Of this gospel I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power. Although I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of the Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for the ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he has carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have access in boldness and confidence through faith in him. I pray, therefore, that you may not lose heart over my sufferings for you. They are your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know that love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Thus ends our second scripture reading.
radical dude. That's awesome. If you've ever seen extreme skiing or extreme mountain climbing on TV or on the internet, then you know that some people love pushing to the edge of what's possible. They like a real thrill. People who touch the edge and do something that's never been done before are often considered radical. It can be a skateboarder, it can be a snowboarder, a skier, a musician, an artist, a gymnast, or whatever. Two nights ago on the news came the story of Lucy Westlake from Illinois, who just became the youngest woman ever at the age of 18 to climb Mount Everest. When questioned about her impressive feat, she said she loves to push the limit. She's already climbed the highest spot in all 50 states, and she's on her way to climbing the highest spot on all seven continents. For some people, there is a drive to go where no one has ever gone before. As an old Star Trekkie, that, uh, that resonates. With technology, commercials and movies defy our senses with the wow factor. Music videos do the same with their strange and bizarre juxtapositions, which, quite honestly, I seldom understand. All of these are little media bites they're very short images that cause us to say to ourselves, wow. The trouble is that they are very short-lived. They are fleeting images, which rapidly move one to another, touching on the edge of wonder and amazement, but seldom lingering quietly for any length of time. And in our culture, we've become accustomed to a sort of rapid-fire entertainment. And with anything less, we tend to get bored in a hurry. Think about media sensations like TikTok and Instagram. Anything more than a couple of minutes is too long. I'd like to suggest that these bites of images which touch the extreme actually can take the sense of they can take the bite out of our sense of wonder. Now, are rapid, wild images, commercials, TikToks, and videos bad in and of themselves? Well, that subject could certainly be debated. All I want to say for this morning is I believe they can numb or distract us from touching a much deeper and more profound sense of wow, wow. In some ways, this has always been true, but it seems like it's harder now than ever to get and then keep the attention of young people. Uh, I started teaching confirmation, and I couldn't keep young people's attention for just an hour. So what I did is I broke it down into seven-minute segments. And every seven minutes, they got one minute off to go get a drink, stand up, whatever. And so we had several breaks in one hour, but I kept their attention. You see, on one level, it could be that it takes more stimulus and quick-moving excitement, as the whole media industry can now do. But at another level, could it be that the deeper, quieter, more reflective ability to wonder is being lost. One of our kids was diagnosed with a form of ADD when going off to college. And I'd like to suggest it be used as an overlay for those of us in the church. And some churches cater to this, by the way. They have big screens and they put up quick medias things and videos for a minute just to get everybody's attention and get everybody kind of... I'm not knocking that, but that's a different style. What I want to say is that, could it be that we all have 
some kind of attention deficit when it comes to our spiritual and faith lives. And so I'm wondering if, if all of us, adults and young people alike, aren't deficient in our wonderment. The British novelist and poet G.K. Chesterton put it this way, the world will never starve for wonders, only for want of wonder. Now I think most people who are open to God, most of you in their lives, they want to touch the edge of wonder and beyond, but so often we just don't take enough time to do it. Or perhaps we simply take life for granted and tend not to see the extra in the ordinary. Listen to the words written 1,400 years ago by St. Gregory the Great. Those things which are full of marvels for an investigation deeper than we can reach have become cheap from custom in the eyes of people. He then gave some examples. If a dead person is raised to life, everyone springs up in astonishment. Yet every day, one that had no being is being born. And no one wonders though it is plain to all without doubt that it is greater thing for that to be created which was without being than for that which had being to be restored. The birth of a baby. Every day a tree is produced from the dry earth and no one wonders. 5,000 people are fed with loaves and fish and yet every day grains of seed that are sown are multiplied enough to feed the entire Earth's population. All wondered to see water once turned into wine. Every day the Earth's moisture being drawn into the root of the vine is turned by the grape eventually into wine, and no one wonders. Full of wonder, then, he concludes, are all the things which people never think to wonder at because they are by habit become dull to the consideration of them. Attention deficit disorder is nothing new when it comes to wonderment, for as I said, those words were written some 1,400 years ago. Here again, just a portion of the psalm text, and I know it was the whole psalm, but it's always good to read the psalms in their entirety. That's the way they were written, so uh, thanks for bearing with that. But uh, Roy read for us, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down, and you are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. The world is a mystery. That the world is is a mystery. Science tells us a great deal about how, how the world is. Uh, I, I was uh, fascinated by uh, astronomy when I was in college, so I took two classes. I took both solar and stellar astronomy. I've always been fascinated by the night sky. And my, oh my, was I impressed this past week to see that picture of the black hole in our own galaxy. If you didn't see it, I highly recommend it. You see, science describes many phenomena and their behavior and their mutual interactions with one another, how, how everything exists in the, in the solar system and our galaxy and so forth. But before the sheer fact of the world's existence, 
that there is a world at all, that anything at all exists, we can only stand in awe, in awe. Before the primal mystery of being, our human speech fails. So I should probably just sit down. Shut up and sit down. But I'll go on. Because the contemporary Catholic theologian, Richard Rohr, shares this very important insight. He said, we've got to consistently remind ourselves that we don't know. Imagine how our politics and our churches could change if we had that kind of humility in our conversations. It just doesn't seem possible anymore. Both politics and religion are filled with people clinging to certitudes on every side of every question. And this makes civil and humane conversation largely impossible because there's no humility. There's no openness to mystery as being that which is always unfolding. Mystery is not that which is not understandable. Mystery is that which is endlessly understandable. On a personal note, I have come to discover that the more I know of myself, the more I know there is to know. I do not know myself completely. And I bet you don't either if you're honest. The deeper I go in myself, I see that I, myself, am a mystery. For me, part of the religious journey is the mystery in me reaching out to the mystery in you and all the world around. And mystery can be touched in the creation around us, just as it can be touched in other people. Part of the deepening of friendship or marriage is mystery reaching out to mystery. It is the mystery in one reaching out to the mystery in another. Now, some people in life want to have everything figured out and nailed down. I suspect they've closed themselves off from God and any real sense of wonder. A story from many years ago. It is not meant to be political. It simply makes the point. Margaret Anderson was editing The Little Review, a radical journal which printed many poems and articles as baffling as Delphic Oracle. Upton, Saint, Sin, Upton Sinclair, who, by the way, ran for governor here in California back in 1934, at the time he was editing a socialist paper, he wrote to Miss Anderson, please do not send me your magazine anymore. I can't understand anything in it, and so do not want it any longer. To which Miss Anderson wrote back, please do not send me your socialist paper anymore. I can understand everything in it, so do not want to receive it anymore. So too in life, when we understand it all, most all the awe departs. As one of the founders of modern physics, Max Planck, observed, Every problem solved unfolds another mystery. It doesn't reduce mystery. The old scientific notion of previous centuries that mystery is gradually evaporating with the advancement of discovery and knowledge simply is not true. The great scientific minds know that mystery grows along with knowledge. Science and religion both, instead of bumping up against each other, they both bump up against mystery. Science and religion require faith. As thinking Christians, 
with incredible minds given to us by God, we are to live into the mystery with both science and faith. Awe, awe is a wonderful way of being in rapport with the mystery of all reality, which ultimately is all a part of God. Is not wonder then, in some form or another, the basis of our worship? If you knew it all, if I knew it all, would we even be here today? And would you respect a God you could completely figure out? I doubt it. I seriously doubt it. How weighty, are, how weighty to me are your thoughts, O oh God? How vast is the sum of them? I try to count them, and they are more than the sand. I come to the end, and I am still with you. Mystery can only barely be embraced by knowledge. It must also be embraced by faith. I'll probably never know all the mysteries of my existence in the world, and yet by faith, I know my life is strangely and strongly guided by the mysterious experience of God's presence desiring to take firmer hold in my life. Sir James Simpson, the discoverer of chloroform, said that the greatest discovery he ever made was that I have a Savior. I have a Savior. And friends, that leads us to our text from Ephesians that Mickey read for us. Here's just a part of that lesson in the context of everything we've been considering this morning. Paul says, This grace was given to me to bring the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is plain of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Now stay with me because he really makes a powerful point. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You see, Embracing mystery in Christ is not controlling or understanding everything. It is participating in mystery with a fullness of faith that only God could intend. It is through the unseen realities and mysteries of life that we can make contact with the love of Christ which passes all human understanding. The mystery the mystery of life in space and time lies beyond space and time. And wow, that's pretty radical, dude. For that is the fullness of God. A science fiction writer, Ray Bradbury, said, we all go on the same search looking to solve the old mystery. We will not, of course, ever solve it. We will climb all over it. We will finally inhabit the mystery. Like the phrase, radical dude, the word awesome has been watered down to describe anything more exciting than sliced bread. But inhabiting the mystery, Inhabiting the mystery, or as our text puts it, letting the mystery inhabit us. 
truly is putting the awe back in us. Today, as we take stock of our lives, as we consider science, faith, and the future, we are blessed by the boundless riches of Christ. So let's, all of us, put the awe back in awesome, such that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith as we are rooted and grounded in love. A love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, a mystery hidden for all the ages. Radical dude, filled with the fullness of God. Amen. Well, we come now to a wonderful time in the life of our church, one of the most exciting times that we have. Baptism and new members uh, are always signs of new life and new birth and new growth in, in our faith lives in the church. Um, and so we're so pleased to be welcoming eight new members into our family of faith today. And um, it is with great joy that Michael and I would like to welcome them. And I'm going to call them uh, to come forward by name. Um, and uh, first, we'll start with Kristen and Oliver Minder. I'm going to ask them to turn and face you so that you can kind of come on up and just, yeah, stand over here, or either side, doesn't matter, and face the congregation so people can see you. And just uh, in case you're wondering, they are hoping to be new parents in just another couple of months, right? Okay, so that's very exciting news. Talk about new growth and, yeah. And then uh, next, uh, we have uh, Kevin Carney and Mari Paterica. Great. And then we have Barbara and Eric DeCure. <laughs> and then we have Navneet Mezchiani, who was married here at the church just back in the fall. So we we're delighted to have not neat. And then Steve Torres. Come on up, Steve. I feel like it's the Price is Right or something coming, <laughs> coming from all over. So. Great. Welcome, Steve. Come on up and, and uh, yeah, great. Let people see you. So take a good look. Um, and these are our eight new members for today. So. <laughs> So I'm going to ask them now, now that you've had a, a good chance to look at them, I'm going to have them turn this way. We have some questions to ask, but it is always a joy when we welcome new members into our family of faith. Um, we are all partners in the ministry of this church, and we affirm it that we are all part of the priesthood of believers, meaning that we're, Michael and I are just called in a particular way to serve the church, but everybody has gifts to share and ministry to share, and so uh, we are so grateful that you're sharing in that partnership with us. Michael? As you come into our midst to unite with us in the ministries and blessing of this congregation, we invite you to reaffirm your faith as members of the Church of Jesus Christ. I will ask each of you two questions, and if you agree, please respond, I do. Do you reaffirm your faith in God as your Father, in Christ as your Lord, and in the Holy Spirit as your strength? Do you promise to participate in the life and mission of this family of God's people, sharing regularly in the worship of God and enlisting the work of this congregation as it serves the community and the world? And now to the Congregation of the United Church of Christ. Neighborhood Church of the United Church of Christ. Let us express our welcome and affirm our mutual ministry by reading in unison the words of the new member's affirmation, which is printed in your order of worship. We, we welcome, welcome you, you with, with joy as members of the church. May your life in this church become our life. Your sorrows are our sorrows. Your joys are our joys. Your dreams our dreams. Let us walk together where God leads and in that walking, come to know the deepest meaning of life and love. 
May God bless you and bless us all in our life together. And now let us all pray. O God of hospitality, we praise you for the opportunity to welcome new members among us today. We thank you for their life stories, their faith journeys, their diversity of gifts. May we who have been here a while be zealous in our willingness to listen and to learn. Make us open to revised visions and new perspectives. Help us provide a nurturing environment for these new friends as we invite them into our church and into our lives. Enable us to take time for one another as we establish a shared faith and a common history. Bless all, O oh God, as we worship together and seek to be your servants in a very needy world. Amen. Well, now it's uh, our custom to present to you both a membership certificate, and Kathy Hendrickson will do that. And then um, also we present to you a membership candle, and uh, uh, we have Jewel and Jim who are going to do that. So, um, yep, you can turn and face the congregation, and they'll go ahead, Kathy, and, and we'll start. Go ahead, Jim. We'll start handing out the candles. Um, as you re yeah, go ahead, uh, Kevin and yeah, and Mari. Yep, yeah, perfect. Okay. So the candle. Uh, obviously represents the symbol of light, but there's a reason for the new member candles. First of all, we remember how Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And so every time we gather each week, we light the Christ candle here on the communion table, and uh, we reaffirm that every Sunday when we rekindle the light of Christ in the Christ candle. So that light is present in your membership candle, but Jesus said something even more radical. He said, you are the light of the world. And so we carry that twin truth with us whenever we light our, our candles because it reminds us that Christ is the light of the world, but we're also called to share that light as Christ's ambassadors uh, on his behalf to the world. So go knowing that both Christ is the light of the world, but you too have a candle. You too have a light to share with the world. Um, and now um, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and blow them out and return to your seats and uh, we'll sing our song of affirmation, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds.
come into our time of prayer where we can have a conversation with God. God is present here, and God is waiting to hear from us. So let us quiet our minds, open our hearts and our souls to have a conversation with God. O oh, gracious God, today we come together to thank you for leading us into our church family. Many of your ways are a mystery to us, but a way that is a revelation of you to us in the family of the neighborhood church. You are revealed to us through this family. Here we are surrounded by close sisters and brothers that all have a common bond to love you as you have loved us and to carry out that love in service to you. We pray that we may never lose sight of what brought us together, and that is you. Dear God, we pray that you watch over the members of your family and keep them safe and secure in the troubled times in which we live, as a nation and as a member of the world body. We ask that you always be accountable to us, and we will be accountable to each other, for we know that we can always come to you in any time or measure or situation. We ask that we always be accountable to one another and never slight one another, but instead have courage with each other in both times of blessing and times of trial. Dear Lord, help us to see and to understand that we are in an exciting time in our church. Our family is growing and the spiritual needs of our family are being met more and more every day. Through you, we are emerging from the effects of a terrible pandemic, and we thank you for your guidance through that pandemic. Lord, we pray for your wisdom to overflow into your congregation as we continue to grow and as we continue to strive to glorify you in all that we do. May we not get caught up in our own egos, or in our own societal status. You are the one who is feeding us and helping us grow. Loving God, help us not to forget those in our family, in our communities, in our nation, and in our world who are suffering due to the loss of a loved one, the effects of a disease, or the economic impact that has caused homelessness and hunger and fear. We pray specifically for all those innocents who are suffering beyond all imagination due to the senseless cruelty brought on by wars that will gain nothing except to ravage countries and people. They, perhaps more than any others, need to experience the love that you have bestowed upon us. So today we thank you for all the blessings and grace you have given to your family that is the Neighborhood Church. Let all of us carry those blessings to each other and also beyond our family, to those who do not know or understand your love that is experienced by being a member of your family. And let us all truly appreciate that the neighborhood church is not just a building, it is a family, God's family in Jesus Christ. And now that I have raised a prayer on behalf of all those who have come to worship you today, please listen to their personal prayers.
O oh, gracious God, we thank you for this time where we have a conversation with you and your mysteries open up for us and your love comes down upon us. We know as we leave here today that you have heard our prayers. Through Jesus Christ we all pray. Amen. We come now to our time of community concerns when we share uh, what's going on in the life of our, our community of faith. And um, there are lots of things in the back of the program, and you can take a look at those later, but I just want to lift up a couple. Um, today is the final day of the crop walk, and uh, if you've not had a chance to respond, you can still make a gift to support that. It goes for both hunger here in the United States as well as hunger around the world, and uh, it's not too late to make a contribution for it to support our crop walk. Uh, today, just shortly after we finish, uh, time to get a cup of coffee and visit briefly, uh, we'll be having a docent tour. And uh, that'll be happening out here by the welcome sign. And anybody who would like to take a 45-minute tour of our church grounds and facility to learn more about the history, um, you're welcome to join us for that. Uh, we'd love to have you. Uh, those have been very, very meaningful and, and helpful to people. So come to the docent tour if you haven't had a chance uh, to do that yet. And then, I hope you will make plans to be here today at 4 o'clock. We have a real special treat. Um, Dr. Hanchu Huang, our organist, will be offering a wonderful recital this afternoon. I can't wait. I've been hearing her practice. She is fantastic. She's world-renowned. I mean, she, she gives concerts all around the globe. And uh, we're lucky to have her giving a concert to us today. Um, and I can't wait, Hank Chu, it'll be great. She's also going to be joined by our former organist of 42 years, Becky Ogle. Uh, they're going to sit down together and do a duet at the keyboard. So uh, watching four hands go across three keyboards and their feet on the pedals uh, should be spectacular. If you've not been to an organ concert uh, here, let me just tell you that we'll have things set up very differently. There'll be a TV monitor on both sides um, so that there'll be a close-up. You'll be Wherever you're sitting, you'll be able to see their hands on the keyboard as well as uh, the feet on the pedals. So uh, it really, really is a marvelous thing, and she's put a lot into it, and I hope you'll come. Um, it's a free concert. There will be a free will donation, and she's donating her time for the concert so that all the funds that are raised through uh, donations will go to help support the, rena the restoration of the organ. Uh, it's been over 20 years since it was built, and it needs cleaning and refurbishment, and that is not cheap, if you can imagine. Uh, so uh, anybody uh, who comes today, uh, no, nothing is expected, except if you'd like to make a contribution, you're welcome to do that. So come, most importantly, come uh, to hear this wonderful recital. And then next Sunday, I hope you'll be here for our annual meeting. Uh, it's the time each year when we come together to uh, hear and receive the reports of our different ministry teams and staff, also to vote on those who are being uh, elected for the new positions in the church. So it's an important business time. We'll be having it right after the worship service here in the sanctuary. We'll try to keep it brief, um, but we hope you'll be here so we have a quorum and can conduct the business of the annual meeting. Uh, and then on a final note, I just want to say, um, again, what a joy uh, it is to welcome our new people into the community of faith today. And they'll be staying uh, for our time of coffee and hospitality out on the terrace. And so I want to invite you just to informally greet them and welcome them into the church. But uh, to all of you, it's great to have you here today. I hope you can stay for a time of friendship and fellowship. And anybody uh, to take the docent tour, that would be great as well. Let's uh, pick up our bulletins again and share responsively in the closing sentences. I can see how it might be possible for people to look down upon the earth and be atheist. But I cannot conceive how they could look up into the heavens and say there is no God. The purposes of the Almighty are perfect and must prevail, though we erring mortals may fail to accurately perceive them in advance. Meanwhile, we must work earnestly in the best lights God's give us, trusting that so working still conduces to the great ends God ordains. And now as you go forth, go forth knowing that you don't know it all. Go forth knowing something of the true presence and reality of God. 
and go forth in the love God bestows. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the communion and friendship of the Holy Spirit go in peace and joy and love this day. Amen.